totally and completely appropriate for the sermon today, the songs that uh, the Lord led Steve to prepare for us. I want us to uh, take a look at the screen, and we're going to have this sermon based on Genesis 22. And uh, this is commonly known as the sacrifice of Isaac. And that would be what you might find on the subtitle before these, these verses. Let me say this before we start. One of the comments that I usually get from um, either unbelievers or believers that may not have been taught correctly on how is it possible that God would ask Abraham to sacrifice his son. We're talking about human sacrifice here. What a brutal and savage religion. Well, let me put it to you this way. God knew that it wouldn't happen. Because he knew what Abraham would do. And yes, there is a father and son relationship that runs parallel to this and is even more important to this that we would call a figure of Christ. This is a picture of our Heavenly Father and His Son Jesus who did go through the sacrifice. The importance is not Abraham and Isaac and what appears to be a request that is inappropriate for some. The message here is that He, the Heavenly Father, would never ask of us what he himself isn't willing to do and has done in his son by offering him as a burnt offering for the sins of the world. That's what John the Baptist called him, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So this is a picture. It runs parallel, figuratively speaking, of the greatest sacrifice and necessary sacrifice for the redemption of the world, those of us that we believe and put our confidence in the finished work of Christ. So that's my statement on those who would say that ours is a bloody religion, a savage religion for this type of petition. And I would say, well, that is also true. There must be a payment for the sins of humanity. And that payment is the shedding of blood, but it was the perfect Lamb of God who fulfilled that. Because sin separates us from God, condemns us not, not ever to be reconciled and forever to be separated from God, not just now, but at all eternity, had it not been for the price that Jesus paid at Calvary's cross. That's worse. He gave us an a way out, a way of escape in his son. What would be worse is that he did nothing and let us all forever be condemned and forever separated from him. But he resolved that issue in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. This story is parallel. This story is a figure of Christ. But in the meantime, as we go through it, it's also a true story, an experience that Abraham lived, and you also do as a Christian. So let's read it, and then we'll get into it before I lose my voice. I feel like I'm going to lose my voice today. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes. Better put the lid on it. 
and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, thank you, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the, a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they both, they went both of them together. When they had come to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now, I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, the original says, Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day, all I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son. I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore, and your offering shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice, Genesis 12, by the way. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham lived at Beersheba, Let's pray. We thank you, Father, uh, this morning for this time in your word, and we ask your blessing, we ask your leading, we ask, Lord, your protection, Lord, as we preach your word, we ask, Father, that whatever it is that you would want to be said, be said, that we would grow and that we would learn and our faith would increase and our witness would be more effective especially in the days that we're living. We thank you. We ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. After these things, God tested Abraham. Well, let me just say this uh, for a little bit of a background. From the time God called Abraham in Genesis 12 to the birth of Isaac was 25 years. He was 75 when the Lord called him out of the uh, Ur, the land of the Chaldeans. He was 75 when he made that journey to the promised land, not knowing where he was going. And we know the story. They went through a lot of tests. That is Abraham and Sarah. They even tried to help God out a little bit at some point during their journey where they were hoping for a son and nothing happened. <laughs> they... They were helping God out a little bit with Hagar, the handmaiden. And of course, the, the son that was born to them was not the one that God had promised. And so 25 years go by and Isaac is born. Now imagine that you had to wait 25 years for God's promise. And God led you every step of the way to that point. Now at this point, the commentaries suggest that Isaac was somewhere between 30 and 40 years old. So this is 50 years after God first called Abraham. 
And he's not a young child, as many suppose. Okay? He's an adult. Abraham is an adult. I'm sorry, Isaac. Isaac is old enough, and let me put it this way, old enough to fight his father. He's old enough to resist his father. Probably could have taken his father. And yet, he complies with Abraham bounding him to the altar. He could have just said, Dad, I think you're senile. I think you're hearing things. I think you're whack. I'm not going to allow you to tie me up and put me on that altar. But here's the first picture of Christ. Christ went voluntarily to the cross. No one had to nail him to the cross. He chose that route because that was the plan of God for his life. He was submissive and he was obedient to the plan of God. So, here we are. That's the background. After these things, what things? A whole life of training. A whole life of experiences. Hey, your experiences matter in life. What you've been through and what God has taught you all these years matters because it's forming you and shaping you into the person that he wants you to be. So don't complain about any part of the journey. Accept them. And God will bless you from that point when you trust them. Yeah, but you're not gonna, you don't know what happened to me, Pastor. <laughs> Could happen to me too. But it's not fair. Who said life is fair? It is what it is. Remember, we lived in a cursed world. You don't think that's true? Look at all the violence. Look at all the death. Look at all the diseases. Look what we're going through. We live in a world that's cursed. But in spite of that, and in spite of the circumstances that we must go through in the tests, God promised to never leave us nor forsake us. You can go on this journey by yourself, and all I can say to you is, good luck. Or you can walk with your hand in his hand and see where he leads you, and I will tell you every single time it is an adventure that will marvel you. God has taken me, and I know God has taken you to places you never imagined that you would even survive, and you shouldn't have. Had he not been with you. Can I get an amen from somebody here? Or am I talking to myself? Because no. I'll preach to myself. I'll, I have preached and taught here with no one here. Amen. That should change too. But I'll sit there on Wednesday with no one here. Talking to this, tel this telephone. Because God's word must go out. He is worthy. He is so good. How can we be quiet? Anyway, after these things, what things? All the things that transpired before Abraham got to this place. Everything, people, church, everything is preparation for something else when you belong to the Lord. Do not moan and groan about it. Uh, uh, Pastor, please. Yes. If I don't tell you this, who will? The world won't. They'll coddle you and they'll, oh, poor baby. Hey, we're men and women of faith. Do you understand that? We serve a God who's all-powerful, with whom there is nothing impossible. We need to change our mindset. We need to have our minds renewed daily. Because the world will beat us up if we allow it to. Or we can come to the feet of Christ and ask him to strengthen us and to take everything that has happened in our life and use it for his glory and honor. And that's the way it works. So after these things, I can't even get out of verse 1. <laughs> verse, there's 19 verses. God tested Abraham. Hmm? God tested Abraham. Yeah, this was an exam. 
because everything is preparation for something else. At some point, this teacher, the rabbi Jesus, the one who sits in heaven, when we belong to him and everything we go through, at some point, he's going to test us. Now, this test was not so much to produce faith as it was to reveal faith. It's not that God doesn't know what you'll score on the test. He wants you to know what you'll score. Don't you want to know if you've learned anything? Don't you want to know if you've learned? Don't you know where, don't want to know where you stand in this journey? Of course. That's what happened here. He tested Abraham. And uh, I will say this. God never tests us above that which we're able to bear and without giving us a way of escape, according to 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Do you hear me? He'll never give you more than you're able to handle in an individual way, in a personal way. He knows you so well. He'll never bring you to a place of testing that he knows that if you trust him, you'll get through it. See, he doesn't put us in the test to destroy us. Oh, God, God, you're trying to kill me. No, he's not. He's trying to build you and edify you. So hang on, saints. It's going to get interesting. But he's going to prove you as he proves himself to you. What is he trying to prove? trying to prove to you that he's faithful. He's trying to prove to you that his word is true. He's trying to prove to you that he'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's trying to prove to you when you run out of your strength and you don't know what to do and you can't figure it out, that he's there with you and he always has a plan that you're not even aware of. But if you quit or turn back, you'll never discover that. You'll forever be in this vicious circle of going nowhere. You'll never pass the test because what do you do with kids? I'm a teacher at a high school level. Kid doesn't pass a test. You're going to have to redo it. In this case, we see that God never tests us above that which he's able, that which we're able to bear, but he gives us a way of escape. What does that mean? God has a blueprint of your life. And if you hang on to him, and it may appear like a maze. You ever been in a maze where you go here, left, oh, wrong turn, left turn? That's our lives. He will get you to the finish line because he already has the plan drawn out for all of our lives, for our lives individually and for our lives collectively as a church. He has a plan for Cross Point Community Church, but he also has a plan for your life individually, and he'll get you through. We'll see that here. So God never asks of us that which he hasn't himself experienced and is willing to do. Now, why would I say that? Because I told you before, this story parallels a relationship between God the Father and his son, Jesus Christ. In this case, we know that Abraham did not have to go through with the sacrifice. But in God's case, he witnessed his son die on a cruel cross and he did it for us. So don't ever say to God, oh, you don't understand. Yes, he does. He understands more than you'll ever imagine because he went through it. Amen. I don't want anyone having compassion with me that can't say to me, I feel you. In other words, you've lived it too. Because you're going to come at me humbly and you're going to come at me sincerely because you know what it's like. You've tasted those experiences. I'm going to say this. There are things I've gone through in my life. When you come to me, and say, hey, Pastor, can you pray for me? Hey, Pastor, can you advise me? I can say to you genuinely from my heart, I know what you've gone through because I've gone through it. And not only have I gone through it, I give all the credit to God that I've gone through it or went through it. Okay, can't even get out of verse 1. This is going to be like a multiple series sermon. we got to squeeze the juice out of all this stuff. 
This is not just God's word. I read, you know, there are people that say, oh, I read the Bible through in 1992. Hey, did you understand anything? No. <laughs> They're all proud about having read the Bible in a year. Big deal. Did you understand any of it? This verse is telling me that God is testing Abraham not to produce faith, but to reveal faith. And I think it's interesting that we understand in the, in the history or in Abraham's life, God built or edified Abraham slowly, piece by piece, year by year, into, into the man he wanted him to be. And this test would reveal the faith that God had built in him over a 50-year period. That's how long it took from the day he called him out of Ur to the day he asked him to take his son up to Mount Moriah. By the way, you know where Mount Moriah is? Jerusalem. But the city wasn't built yet in Abraham's time. And here's the interesting part. The very same mountain, Golgotha, is where Mount Moriah is. The very same place where Jesus hung on the cross is the very same place that Isaac was taken to. Isn't that a weird thing? No, it's not. God knew exactly what he's doing. He always has known. As a matter of fact, those of you that let me put it this way. Those of you that understand prophecy, understand that God wrote history in advance. That's who we serve. He knows what's going to happen tomorrow. He knows what's going to happen in a year. He knows what's going to happen in five or ten or thousands of years ahead if I don't think we'll get there. Because his coming, his second coming is sooner than we imagine. And we need to be ready. So I can't imagine being a father, those of you that are fathers, those of you that are parents, mothers. I cannot imagine a greater test than that which the Lord applied to Abraham. You, you're telling me to offer up my son? I mean, sometimes I got these crazy thoughts in my mind from working with teen teenagers. After the Lord told Abraham this, I think in my head, is you is or is you not crazy? <laughs> I mean, what? This is my only son I waited 25 years for. And now you're asking me to take him up to this mountain and offer him up as a sacrifice? Mm-hmm. Think about this for a minute. This story shows us something very important. It shows us that Abraham would obey because he trusted God. That's where he had arrived. Here, Abraham would prove his loyalty, his sincerity, the fact that he's in alliance with, that means in agreement with, cooperating with the Lord of hosts, and that God was a promise keeper. Because didn't God said that through his offspring, through one of his descendants, and the only kid he has is Isaac, he's thinking in his mind, God, you made this promise to me that from this son that you would give me, that you finally gave me 25 years later, that the world would be blessed through one of the descendants and who is that seed of Abraham that would bless all the nations it's none other than Jesus Christ so Abraham is thinking in his mind I don't know what God's going to do because we can sit there and try and figure it out but it's, a, it's an exercise in futility Abraham knows that God's going to somehow preserve Isaac and in the Hebrew letter, it says that he believed that God was even able, if necessary, to raise him from the dead, another figure of Christ. Abraham and Isaac is a picture of our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. And did he not raise them from the dead? Because without the resurrection, Christianity has no power. We're just plain religion, but we're not. We depend on the same power that rose Christ from the dead to rise us from the dead. Amen. And it's the same power that takes us as sinners and transforms our lives and our hearts into the born-again experience. Because we died at the cross with Christ. And he died in our place for us. Anyway, 
there's so many ties here that um, we can see that God keeps his promises and Abraham believed that even though he didn't understand now take your son your only son whom you love whom you love and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Wow. Before we get to verse 2, look at the last part of verse 1. What was Abraham's response? Here I am. Wow. Abraham has a quick answer doesn't he? He answers quickly this call of God. And it's a wonderful example to us of men or women of faith and how we should respond to God when he calls us. Did he wait? No. Did he delay? No. He just said, here I am. I thank God that as I get along this journey further and further away from my immature years as a Christian, that I have learned, and I hope you have learned, and if you haven't, you can learn right now, the quickest way to get through a test is to just say, here I am. Don't say anything else. Here I am meant when Abraham responded, I'm ready to be taught. And notice Abraham doesn't ask why. There's nowhere in the text you'll find out that he asks why. Sometimes that's our first thing we say. Why? Why, Lord? What we need to learn to say is what? What do you want to teach me? What we need to understand is when Abraham says, here I am, that he's ready and willing to obey and here's the toughest part. Gosh, this is tough. Those of us that are fathers, those of us that are parents. He was willing to surrender his son to the Lord. Fathers, there could not be a better thing you could ever do with your sons and daughters than say, Lord, they're, they belong to you. you just renting them out to me. You're just... Your, your children are just leased to you. And then they hit a certain age where they become adults and they'll have to make their own decisions and hopefully you'll be able to say when you let them go, say, Lord, I did my best and in spite of the fact that I'm not a perfect father, I did the best I could to teach them about you and your ways and your word. And there they go, having to live the life of faith just like you are having to live the life of faith. There can never be. And there's one of the greatest test as a father to say to the Lord, here he is. Not to embarrass Sam, my son, I can say the same thing here as we look on and look beyond. How many times I've said, Lord, here he is. He's yours. Not mine. You guys know that as parents? So when Abraham says, here I am, he was not only ready to be taught, he was not only willing to be obedient, he was uh, willing to surrender, and he did not hesitate to allow God to examine him, because David in the psalm says, Lord, examine me and reveal to me if there be any perverse ways in me. In other words, reveal to me where I've lack. Reveal to me where I'm weak. Reveal to me where I may offend you so that I can what? Make amends so that I can work on that. See, because we are a work of art in God's hands. In Ephesians, Paul says we're his workmanship. Workmanship? The word really is poema in Spanish, meaning we are his poem. In other words, in a sense of literature or in a sense of a genre, God is writing out our story. 
You know, I could actually stop right now, and I think I've said enough for the Sunday morning. Okay. But I'm going to keep going. And that's okay. I've kind of got my eye on the watch. I'm, I know I'm not going to finish. So this is going to be a two-part sermon. So, God calls Isaac. Notice here, when we go to verse 2 now. Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Now, here's an interesting thing. Didn't Abraham have another son? His name was Ishmael. But God called Isaac Abraham's only son. Huh. You know why? Because Ishmael is a product of the flesh. Isaac is a product of the spirit, of the promise. God never acknowledges the things that we have accomplished or the deeds that we have done in the flesh. Why? Because they're buried with Christ at Calvary's cross. They've been erased. Anything we do in the flesh, God forgives us and forgets it. We don't so easily, but God does. Do not let the devil condemn you or make you feel guilty for your past. If you have gone to the foot of the cross, well, there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. There should be no guilt in your life because then you're questioning the worthiness of the sacrifice of Christ. And you're questioning, you are free from your past to live and serve God from this moment forward. Can someone say amen? amen. And so anyway... God doesn't recognize Ishmael, even though he had a son, because that son was the product of man's efforts. God never recognized our efforts, but what we should always live in is his favor. So he doesn't even acknowledge that Ishmael, Ishmael um, exists. But let me say it in this way, because he does bless Ishmael also. When Hagar was kicked out because Sarah complained about the mocking that took place at Isaac's bar mitzvah, go back and read it in Genesis, she was let go, if you would, fired, I guess, because she was a handmaiden. God met her in the desert also when she was alone and promised to bless Ishmael and make him a great nation. Unfortunately, that nation has always been a thorn in the flesh to Israel. Because when we try to help God out, those pro the product of those efforts will always be a thorn in the flesh in the spiritual realm. What I'm trying to say is, God only saw one son, and it was the son of the covenant, which was Isaac. Take that son, your only son, and then if it weren't enough, he has to, he makes it, he reveals it, he states whom you love. It's just not a son. It's the one you love. By the way, it's the only one he has that counts for the covenant. <laughs> Time out, Lord. What you're asking me is to take my only son. <clears throat> Let me get this right. Whom I love. Now that's where I draw the line, Lord. I think you're getting a little bit too personal in my life. You, you, you stop you writing. You can't venture into this area of my life, Lord. That belongs to me. Am I off here, Ricardo? But have we done it? Yeah. I mean, think about it. God says it. Take your son, your only son, because you only recognize Isaac because of the covenant, whom you love. And so we could say as an, an excuse, maybe, or a reason to not be obedient, but Lord, it's the son who I love. And the Lord says, I know, I just said that. What? Yeah. He wants all of you. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. He never said, you shall love the Lord with all, oh, wait, hold on, with 50% of your heart, mind, and strength. 
or you should love the Lord your God with 75%. 75% is a good average. It's not enough for the Lord. He wants all of you and all of yours. Wow. Yeah. Do you even realize that you, the next breath you take and the next heartbeat in your chest is all because of him anyway? You're his already. Why are we playing the game like we're not? It's called pride. Arrogance. Ignorance. Whatever you want to call it. Rebelliousness. You as a child of God, the Lord, Your only son whom you love. Interesting, I found this in a commentary, and I have to share it because it's not my idea or my discovery, but other than my study. So I found out. You know where he says, whom you love? Going all the way back to Genesis 1-1. This is the first mention of love in the Bible. You'll never find the word love in the Bible starting from Genesis 1-1 to now we're in the 20th second chapter of Genesis. It took 22 chapters and thousands of years for the Lord to write, as far as writing the word love, it's the first time it's mentioned. And it comes in the context of a love between a father and his son. And it's connected to the idea of a sacrificial offering of that son. Isn't that amazing that the first mention of love is a sacrificial offering between a father and a son. And we know that this is important in this part of the story to Abraham and he loved his son. But it's really pointing to the father who loved his son and would offer him up for us at Calvary's cross. There's no greater love than the one who would lay down his life for his friends. Every thing that is said in God's command to Abraham was like a knife. Look, take your son now, your only son, whom you love. Offer him there as a burnt offering. All of that must have been very painful and difficult for Abraham to hear. But you know what I'll say to you as I looked at this this week and studied this? Verse 2 reveals to us that God loved, or rather that Abraham loved God. It doesn't say anything about it there, does it? It's an inference, and I'll tell you why. Abraham loved God in this verse because when you surrender what you love most to God, you're proving that you love God more. I don't know if you guys got that part. Abraham loved God is what's implied here. Not only was he obedient, he was. But he loved God. And you say, well, how do you know that, Pastor, from what we're reading here? Because when you, and you know this to be true if you've done it, when you surrender to God what you love most, that is evidence that you love God more. And that's what he wants. Let me just say at this point, <laughs> just to kind of encourage you, because a lot of times I want to get away from the back of this pulpit like I used to when, before the camera. But here's what I want to say. That um, you love God whenever you surrender that which you love the most. And, as I said, Sounds pretty difficult at this time because we're talking about offering Isaac on an altar. We're talking about his life, right? But thank God we read the whole story. Okay, let me get that part. Let me get. Let me bring you back because I see some faces out there that are kind of like, oh, dear Lord. It all ends up well at the end of the story. I just have to. Don't forget. At the end, God provided the lamb for himself, Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide, okay? We're at a point now, though, where we have to see 
And I, if I cannot put flesh and blood on this story, if I can't make it real to you sitting here today, what happened thousands of years ago, I have failed as a pastor. But I don't think I have. Because Abraham loved God more than he loved his own son, who he really loved. And that's the key and the secret to a relationship with God the Father. As a matter of fact, not just your son he wants. He wants all of you. He wants your fears. He wants your doubts. He wants your vices. He wants your anger. He wants your jealousy. He wants all of you. It's okay. You confess your sins. 1 John chapter 1 tells us, verse 18, If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. It's okay. Let him know because he already knows. And if we think we can hold on to something, if we love something more than him, the relationship with the Father is impacted negatively. You're not living in the richness of what could be your life, you're living in poverty when you should be living in blessing and riches that are related to the kingdom of God. Because you are in the kingdom of God. Abraham learned that over a long period of time. So what happened? This is, these are the instructions, right? So what does Abraham do? Verse 3. So, <laughs> okay, I like to do this. I always like to say in a lesson, so what? So, what did Abraham do? He rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, right? Continue. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Flip back to the beginning of that, if you wouldn't mind, Debbie. When Abraham rose early in the morning, there's no sign in this act and on Abraham's part, right, that he was hesitating. Is that true? And, uh, Lord, I think I'm going to need to think about this for a while. <laughs> you guys can laugh at me. Come on, loosen up a little bit. Because you know that's you, because I know it's me, and I'm the pastor. Lord, um, you've got some really good ideas, but I'm going to have to ponder them for a while. I need to figure it out a little bit. Just give me a few years and I'll be back with you. <laughs> Isn't that what we do? Why? Of course. You know, one of the greatest liberations for you as a Christian is to be transparent. I'm up here revealing to you that that's what I do. Your pastor. But man, is it liberating. Because I don't have to be fake. He'll take you where you are. With all your weaknesses. With all your problems. With the mess you've created. And he'll take you from there and he'll transform your life if you would only rise up early in the morning and do what he says. Okay? As far as I can read, he doesn't hesitate. He doesn't delay. He doesn't wait. 
He doesn't say, hey, let me get back to you about this. No. Abraham rose up early in the morning. He did exactly what God told him to do. And um, I'm not going to doubt that he probably had a sleepless night. Think about it. Don't you think maybe he might have not slept a, a little bit? Might have thought about it a little bit. Might have walked around the bedroom going, hmm. Oh, wow. Lord, this is a big one. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I trust you. No hesitation on his part. His obedience shows that he trusted God. Even when he didn't understand, believe me, he didn't understand. I don't understand anything anymore. As I get more into this walk of faith, tell me if it's not true for those of you who have been walking with the Lord for a while, that the more you know about him, the more you realize you don't know anything about him, but the more blessed you are because every time he reveals more of himself to you. Yeah, I don't understand. Seems a little bit contradictory, Lord. I mean, this is the son that you will bless all the nations with. And how can he not? How, if I if I go through with this, then Hebrews eleven says he believed God would raise him from the dead if he did go through by faith, because we serve the God that raises dead. And he proved it first in his son, Jesus Christ. I'm talking about raised from the dead to eternity. I get it. Lazarus was raised from the dead too and he eventually died again. And But he went to heaven. He was a believer. So Abraham's obedience also shows that he wasn't going to argue with God or debate him. And that's sometimes a problem that we have. We want to debate God. We want to argue with God. So we want to hesitate, right? We want to understand. We want to try and come to some kind of a logical or reasonable, uh, you know, let's talk about this a little bit. No, we don't read anything about that happening here. He didn't go looking for advice or counsel from his friends or anybody else. There's nothing written about, about it. He just knew what to do. And instead of stalling and using a stalling tactic, which we're very good at, he simply just obeyed God by, and trusted him. That's what I like about this. He shows that he trusted God, even though he probably didn't feel like doing it. Because how many of us would say, well, I don't feel it. Right? Didn't feel like it. Let me say this a little bit about emotions. Even though you may not emotionally feel like you can or want to do what God asks you to do, we don't walk by feelings, but we walk by faith. We don't walk by understanding 100% what God's doing. We walk by faith. We don't walk by becoming debaters with God. How many of us here are good at arguing with God. I don't see any hands. Okay, I, this, I, I don't. You guys would say, Pastor, what do you mean? It's been a long journey. I've been doing this for 45 years. I remember one time I went through something in my life that was to change my life. I remember one time I was driving down the road and I was bitter because I hadn't let go. And I was trying to figure it out and I wanted to feel sorry for myself. I remember I rolled down the window and I shook my fist at God. He said, what? Yeah, I did. And guess what? He didn't strike me dead. We don't surprise God. He knows what you're thinking. And he's trying to move you from that place where you are to a better place when he puts us into these tests. There's not an argument. There's not a question. 
there's no hesitation, and I'm sure that he thought, and that this is how we should think. Hey, God, you're God. Um, I, I really want to want to ask why, but instead I'm going to ask what. What is it that you want from me? I'm going to do it. That's where he had arrived. Because the Lord had trained Abraham over many decades. And he brought him to this place where he could trust him. We see then, this had happened already earlier when he had to give up Ishmael. He had already had somewhat of a test. Some already had a little bit of an experience of what it was like to give up a son. He loved Ishmael too. But Ishmael wasn't the one God chose. And he has to accept what God chooses. We have to accept what God chooses. We have to accept what God asks of us. And when we do, we will live a life with God present. And everything that seems impossible to us is possible, not because of us, but because God is with us. I'm going to stop here. I wanted to go further. Let's see. One more thing. I'm going to use this as a hook for next week. On the third day, verse 4, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young man, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship. And come again to you. Wow. So how many days is he traveling to the place that was afar off? Verse 4. Three days. How many days was Jesus in the tomb? Three days. Isn't that ironic? No. Abraham and Isaac are a picture are a figure of the Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus. This was written 3,000 years before Jesus appeared. Talk about God being in control of history. He wrote the story before for us to see. Why we, let's go back to verse 4. <laughs> Sorry. I'm, I'm digging in a little bit here, Debbie. The third day he lifted up his eyes and he saw the place from afar. So he said, wow, there's the place I got to do this. Three days to think about it. What God had commanded him to do. That made the test even further. Because, you know, a lot of times when you have to think about it longer, that makes it tough. Right, Steve? But here's what I'm going to leave you with. He says to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship. Remember I told you that the word love that's mentioned in verse 2 is the first time it's mentioned in the Bible. Well, the word worship, this is the first time it's mentioned in the Bible. And it's mentioned when Isaac and his father, Abraham, have to go and offer a sacrifice. What we see here is a man who worships God no matter what God asks of him. I think he's passing the exam, don't you? <laughs> so far. And this other statement. Even though he knows that he's going to that place that's so far off that now that he can see, he says, we're going to come again to you. Come again to you. Who's going to come back to where the servants are with the donkey. I and the boy, we're coming back. That's faith. Now, I'm going to read to you a passage from Hebrews 11, 17 through 19. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it is said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. In his head, he died and rose again, and that's a picture of Christ, and that's what he said here. We're going to worship. What are they worshiping? worshiping. They're worshiping the resurrection. 
That's the key to our faith. That no matter what happens to us, we will rise again. You know why? Because our Lord did. Amen. Yeah. That's uh, previews to next week. We'll start at verse 4. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Uh, thanks for your word, Lord, because when we read it, wow, does it ever speak to us and it speaks boldly to us. But thank you for being so direct with us because sometimes we need it. And this test is test of all tests. We're, we're happy to know that we can read the end of the story and Abraham passed and Abraham graduated. Uh, he graduated eventually into heaven like we will. Help us, Lord, to be more like Abraham, the father of faith. Help us, Lord, as your people to be aware that you're working in our hearts. That you're patient with us. Abraham didn't get to this place like overnight. It, it took 50 some years. And every day matters because every day is preparation for something else that you're doing in our lives. We ask you to continue to bless us as a church. I ask your blessing on each and every person here that they would walk by faith, not by sight. That they would not give so much importance to the temporary things of this life, but that they would give all of the value to what you have asked of us. And knowing, Lord, that you are a faithful promise keeper. Just like you were with Abraham, you will be with us. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.